Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. How powerful you are. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. Jesus, 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 Jesus,
standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. struggles on the way but with joy our hearts can say never once did we ever walk alone by your constant grace and within your perfect peace never once no we never walked alone number 54, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, choir. Thank you, congregation. Let me invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I will be finishing up our series on stewardship this morning, uh, but before we do, we need to take a look at one more thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And if you've found your place, let's stand together as we give honor and reverence to God's Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> there the Word of God says, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know your willingness, about which I boast of you, to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, He has dispersed abroad and has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God while through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity that we have to spend the next few minutes in your Word. And Lord, I pray that through the Holy Spirit's working, that all distractions, whether those that we have brought with us or those that... Satan will put in front of us, might be removed, that we can give ourselves completely and fully to your word and to the leading of your spirit. We ask this for the glory of Jesus, in his name, amen. Thank you. may be seated. <clears throat> I remember uh, quite distinctly a few years back, I was sitting in a uh, hospital waiting room um, and while one of our members was having surgery talking with the family, and, and I found it somewhat strange that um, on one of the televisions there in the waiting room, there was um, a Christian broadcasting channel, and there was a gentleman there who was um, obviously a, a pastor, a preacher, and he was preaching away, and, and um, you know how sometimes in those hospital rooms they have rows of seats that are, that are back to back, and, and so I'm sitting there, and there's, there's a couple of ladies sitting directly behind me. And you can't help but sort of overhear what people are saying when you're sitting that close to each other. And uh, one of them says to the other about the TV preacher, uh, she says, well, I'll tell you right now, all them TV preachers are the same. They just want your money. What I want to know is what I'm going to get out of it. That was the end of that conversation. The other lady didn't really know how to respond, and so she did what most of us do. She said, well, well, <laughs> you know, we kind of laugh nervously when we don't know what to say. What do you say to that, you know? What do I get out of it? Well, let, let, me, let me say one thing up front. You do need to be very careful about the ministries that you choose to support because not all of them are honestly kingdom-focused ministries at least not towards God's kingdom. So, so do be very careful. And in one sense, as you obviously understand, 
Uh, the idea of I want to know what I'm getting out of it is not only wrong-headed, but it's wrong-hearted. It's focused on us rather than on what God can do with what we give. However, I'm going to run the risk this morning of appealing to our selfish natures. Because in one sense, the theology is absolutely inescapable. There are real benefits to our generosity. We really do get something out of it. Now, that ought not never be our goal. I give so that I get. That's, that's not right. That's wrong-headed, wrong-hearted. But God in His grace, God in His undeserved kindness that He showers upon us, God has made giving operate in such a way that when we give, He showers His grace upon us. Now, we turn to this passage of Scripture this morning because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to see it in God's inspired word. Paul here is writing to the Corinthians, and he mentions in verse 1 uh, concerning the ministering to the saints. Now, if we, got, if we backed up into chapter 8 and got a little bit of context on this, we would come to learn that this is a special collection that was not... Paul is not addressing the biblical tithe at all in either of these two chapters. He is talking about offerings that go above and beyond the biblical tithe. This is the giving of relief to some of the believers in Judea that were battling a famine that was going on there. And so Paul is writing to them about this love offering that he is collecting. As a matter of fact, that love offering and the collecting of those funds was one of the primary purposes in Paul's third missionary journey. I want you to take a look at this map that's uh, going to come up here, and you can see this red line is uh, all where Paul traveled on his third missionary journey. It's, uh, it's very difficult to see, but on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see uh, a map ledger there, and if you can't make out the words, let me just let you know that that top black line there is 200 miles. Now, if you kind of approximate this and look where Corinth is, which is this bottom left corner where it kind of does a dog leg there, if you measure as the crow flies from Corinth down to Jerusalem, you're going to be in the neighborhood of about 1,000 plus miles. That's a long way. 1,000 miles, if you start in Wilmington, North Carolina and get on I-40 West and start driving you will go past Nashville, Tennessee before you reach a thousand miles. That's a long drive, isn't it? And, and, and I think it's fair to say that a thousand miles back in these days, before they had interstate highways and cars with air conditioning and all these other things, a thousand miles was further back then than it is today. When you had to walk most of it and sometimes you were able to get on a ship and if you've ever been out deep sea fishing, you know what I mean. That's not easy travel. These people are a thousand miles away. The likelihood of the believers in Corinth ever setting eyes on the believers in Jerusalem is, is so astronomically absurd, it's not even worth mentioning. Now, obviously, they'll spend eternity in heaven together, but in this life, these two groups of people will most likely never meet. So why is Paul? Why is Paul asking these Corinthian believers to give to the relief effort of people thousand, a thousand miles away that they'll never see, never know, never have a conversation with? I mean, after all, after all, they need to take care of the people that's right there in their own community, right? That's usually what we say. We say, well, them people over there need to take care of themselves. We've got to take, people, take care of our people here. Right? Well, yes, we do need to take care of the people in our community. It would be a shame upon the church if we didn't take care of the people in our community. But I'll tell you something else. We don't need to take care of the people in our community to the exclusion of helping other people across the world. It's a both and, not either or. But what I want you to notice, what I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture 
is that as Paul is seeking to motivate these Corinthians to give to this relief effort, you notice that he does not spend his time motivating them by talking to them about how bad things are in Judea. He, he apparently does not bring with him uh, any photographs of starving children in Jerusalem. He does not put before them as the primary motivator the physical needs of the people in Judea. Now, obviously, that's part of the motivation, but I think it's important for our purposes this morning to realize that what Paul concentrates on and what he seeks to motivate the Corinthians with is what the Corinthians will benefit from. That's important. Because it's not just about helping those, those believers all the way down in Judea. It's about helping themselves. It's about seeing God do a great work in them, a work that money cannot buy. There are two groups of people that are mentioned in this passage. We'll give you a little zoomed-in picture here so that you can see it a little better. Uh, Paul is writing to Corinth, which is down here in the region of Achaia, and he is at the present time writing from Macedonia, which is the region directly to the north. And he is saying to the people that the churches in Macedonia have gathered together a great gift and I'm on my way to see you and, and y'all remember what you promised last year. You said you were going to give to this. Just wanted to remind you so that when I get there, uh, you won't be embarrassed. That's the point of him writing and reminding them about this. But he's on his way. He's on his way to Achaia, specifically to Corinth, so that they can be a part of God's work in this. But again, the primary motivations that Paul mentions in this passage of Scripture don't have anything to do with the people in Jerusalem or those that are in physical need. It has to do with what God's going to do through the generosity of the people in Corinth. So I want to submit this to you this morning as an idea. Would you agree with this statement? God can do things with your generosity that money cannot buy. God can do things with your generosity that money cannot buy. Spiritual blessings, immaterial blessings, things that, that we might not otherwise think of, but God will do things with your generosity that you can't do by writing a check. It's the generosity that brings about these things that we're going to talk about. And in this passage of Scripture, there are three that are mentioned. Three things that God can do through our generosity. Now, there may be more as you uh, study the Scripture from beginning to end, but in this passage of Scripture, there are three, and so that's what we're going to comment on and concentrate on. Look at verse 2, would you? Verse 2. Paul says in verse 2, I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Paul is saying that the people here in Macedonia have heard about the promise that you made. Sometime, a year, about a year ago, Paul had, had uh, written to them, or they had written to Paul in some of the letters that we don't have anymore. And there was a promise made by the Corinthians that they were going to give, and that they were going to give generously to the relief effort uh, for the saints in Jerusalem. So as Paul begins his third missionary journey... Part of it was to go around and collect these funds everywhere he goes. He says, now let me tell you what the people in Corinth have promised. People in Corinth have promised that they are going to really give. They're going to give generously to all this. Now, now that's what they're going to do. What are you going to do? And everywhere he goes, particularly in the region of Macedonia, the Macedonians are stirred up by what the Corinthians have promised to do. Now this word stir up that we're, we're reading here in verse 2 can have some positive aspects to it as well as some negative aspects to it. Example, have you ever stirred up a bee's nest? You ever stirred up one of those? Now, you, there's a lot of excitement in that situation, isn't there? It's not all good. The bees are excited, you're excited, everybody's excited, but it's not necessarily a good thing. But Paul is using that same idea of, of this, this mutual excitement that's being stirred up in everyone as a positive. He's saying the Macedonians were stirred up by what you said you were going to do. And, and then he sort of says, and, and I hope you hadn't forgot what you said you were going to do. As we read it, did you kind of get the idea that Paul wanted to make sure that they hadn't forgot it? 
Uh, and, and so he says, And so I thought it was good to send the brothers on to you so that when they arrive, they can ensure that what you promised is actually there so that when I arrive with the Macedonians, I'm not embarrassed because I told them what you were going to do. And more than that, you won't be embarrassed. And you need to realize that these Macedonians have really given. They've given and they've given a lot. So you Corinthians, uh, you be stirred up by their generosity. You see what happened? At first, the Macedonians were stirred up by the promised generosity of the Corinthians, and now the Corinthians are being stirred up by what the Macedonians have actually done. They have provoked one another. They have provoked one another to generosity. And that's one thing that your generosity can do. Your generosity can provoke generosity in other people. And you can't buy that with money. Your generosity can provoke generosity in other people. Now, there's, there's a flip side to that, and that is that if we, if we refuse to be generous, well, that can dampen the generosity in other people. Now, please do not misunderstand. I am not at all suggesting that we need to be in competition with one another. Not at all suggesting that when you go to Sunday school next week that you lean over to the person sitting beside you and say, how much you plan on giving? I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just simply saying that as people observe your joyful, cheerful, sacrificial generosity, it will move and it will do a work in their life. And it's not just in the area of, of generosity that this works. It, it works in the area of praying. When people see you pray and pray earnestly, they're more likely to pray. When they see you work and work earnestly, they're more likely to see you work. When they see you witness, they're more likely to witness. And yes, when they see us give and give courageously and sacrificially, yes, they are more likely to do the same. But do not give so that you can boast about it. You do that, you'll cheat yourself out of any blessing that may be coming. But if, on the other hand, your desire is, is partly to provoke generosity in other people, that is a good thing. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. This verse is not on the screen, but just look it up when you get home. In that verse, Hebrews 10, 24, we are told to provoke one another unto love and to good works. Is giving to the kingdom of God a good work? Yes, so we ought to seek ways to provoke that in each other. And here's how we do it. We give courageously, we give sacrificially, and we give with the goal of glorifying God. Give courageously, give sacrificially, and give with the goal of glorifying God. That's one thing that your generosity can do that money can't buy. But let me show you a second. What else can God do through your generosity? If you jump into verse 6, look at verse 6. Paul says there, I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He who sows sparingly, if you put in a little, you're going to get a little bit back. If you put in a lot, you're going to get a lot back. It's an agricultural illustration. I know that we got some farmers that are here. I grew up on a farm, so uh, you, you may look at that verse and say, well, not always. And that's true. That's true. If, if we're talking about sowing seed in the ground, there are those years when you put a lot of seed in the ground when the rain doesn't come or when the disease does come or when, when the, the pestilence comes or whatever, and you've sowed bountifully, but you don't reap bountifully. But that's not the angle that Paul's taking on this. Paul is, is, is coming at it not from the angle of what can happen. He's coming at it from the angle of what was your intention. What was your intention when you sowed the seed in the ground? If you put just a little bit in, well, don't expect to get much back. But at the same time, if you intend to receive a large crop, you will sow a large amount of seed. Why? Because we know that God blesses our giving in proportion to what we give away. If you give away a little bit, you get a little blessing in return. If you give away a lot, then according to God's Word, if you sow bountifully, God, according to His character, will bless you bountifully. Amen? Is that not what verse 6 says? So let me just put it this way. If you only want a little bit of blessing in your life, 
then just give a little bit. Now, I don't want that for you. And God doesn't want that for you. For that matter, I don't think you want that for yourself. Anybody here this morning that just wants a thimble full of God's blessing? Now, don't give me too much, Lord. I want just a little bit. Anybody? No, of course not. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here to begin with. You want God's abundant blessing in your life, right? Well, if you want God's abundant blessing in your life, here is the way God says go about finding it. So abundantly, so that you'll reap abundantly. But it's also important to know what your motive is as you're sowing. Verse 7 says, Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Don't give out of a sense of duty. Don't give out of a sense of I'm being forced to do this because if you give in that motivation, you're going to cheat yourself out of the blessing of joy that comes from giving from a cheerful heart. Or to put it another way, you can give begrudgingly, you can give of necessity, and God will still bless your gift, but He won't bless the giver. And you'll miss out on what God has for you. Verses 8 through 11 answer the question that we're already beginning to form in our mind. But now, wait a minute. If I sow bountifully, that means I've got to give away a lot. Now, I, I'm, I, I know God can, God can multiply that and He can cause me to reap super abundant about, bountifully. I, I, I get that. But what am I supposed to do in the meantime while the seed is in the ground? How's that supposed to work? Where, where are the needs of my daily life going to come from? Well, the Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, answers that question before it's ever asked. Notice in verse 8, as well as in verse 11, how many times the word all, or some idea of this, in, this total inclusiveness, comes up. Notice. And God is able... Let me just stop right there. Anybody in here believe that God is able? God is able, amen? <laughs> right. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Did y'all see how many times that, that idea came up? Let me get you to zoom in on one phrase there. He says, always having all sufficiency in all things. You see that? God is able to make all grace abound to you that you always, how often? Always. Having all sufficiency. So how, how much is God going to give us? He's going to give us everything we need, right? Isn't that what all sufficiency means? Now, he didn't, he's not going to give us everything that we greed. <laughs> everything that we need, all sufficiency in what things? All things. Always, all the time. All sufficiency, everything that we need in every situation. Can God be trusted? Can God be trusted to meet our needs while the seed's in the ground? Of course He can. Now, if we believe that, we'll sow. You need to also understand that, that most of the blessings, most of the blessings that you will receive in response to your generosity, are not going to be material blessings. They're probably not going to be material blessings. This is not some kind of uh, divine Ponzi scheme, you know, where I'm going to give God a little bit today and God's duty-bound to give me a million dollars tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. But God may very well give you things that even somebody with a million dollars would covet, like peace, joy, quietness in your home, restored relationships with your family. And all these things that honestly everybody really wants, money cannot buy it, and God's the only source to find it. And what he is telling the Corinthians here is that in many ways this is connected to their generosity. Your generosity can provoke others to generosity, but secondly, your generosity will result in numerous blessings. Numerous blessings. Numerous. And perhaps a better word would be innumerable blessings. 
Blessings that are too great and too far in number for us to even count. And what God is, is challenging us to do, what He is saying, test me in this, is He's saying, look, sow bountifully and see if you won't reap bountifully. Material blessings, yes, but things that even money cannot buy. It's, it's about making an investment. And you're already doing this in other areas of your life God's just saying, give me a shot at it. Let me just give you one example. Are you aware that in 2012, Americans spent $32.5 billion in dietary supplements? $32.5 billion, that's a bunch of zeros, billion dollars in dietary supplements. One of the most popular dietary su supplements that is on the market for men is GNC's Mega Man. I just felt like saying it. Are there any Mega Men in the house this morning? I'm just, just curious. Uh, if you are, you may be insulted by what I'm about to say. But anyway, when you think about this product, it's one of the, the top five selling dietary supplements for men. Here's, what, here's what's advertised. In GNC's Mega Men, you will get 1,600 IUs of vitamin D for colon health and immune support, B vitamins for energy support, selenium, lycopene, and vitamin E to support prostate health. It fights cell aging with advanced antioxidant blend. And you can have all this, ladies and gentlemen for $20 a bottle. $20 for nine ninety foul-smelling, foul-tasting capsules. Now think about that. Let's suppose that you walked into the store and you laid down a $20 bill and walked out with 90 of these foul-tasting, foul-smelling capsules and someone said to you on the, on the street, Wow, are you, are you aware you just spent 22 cents each for those bad-tasting things? I can't believe you just gave away $20 just to get bad-tasting pills. You would respond, no, 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 no. I didn't get bad-tasting pills. I gave away the $20 so that I could have a healthy colon and a healthy prostate and a healthy immune system. And actually... That's not even true. You, you gave the $20 away in the hopes of having a healthy colon, a healthy prostate. Y'all didn't realize the word prostate could come up so many times in a sermon, did you? But a healthy colon, a healthy prostate, healthy immune system. You, you gave that away in the hopes of having this. And God says, God says, I'm not giving you a promise that may or may not come true. I'm saying that when you invest with God, He's always faithful. There's always a return on the investment that far, far outweighs anything that we could possibly think or imagine. We already give away money in an attempt to get things that money can't buy. We already do that. But the promise of generosity is a certain promise for blessings that money can't buy. Now, we shouldn't give, like I said, just to get something out of it, but the theology here is inescapable. God says His character will be such that, that we will receive immaterial blessings that far surpass any value of the material resources that we give back to Him. That's what He says. Now, some of those blessings may be material. Some of those blessings may very well be material. Some of them, most of them are going to be immaterial. Some of them are going to be eternal. But they always, they always exceed the value of the investment. Or to put it simply, it's always, always, always worth it. It's always worth it. You can't buy that with money. But your generosity can result in some numerous blessings that money cannot buy. It'll provoke generosity in others. It'll result in numerous blessings. And let me show you one last thing that comes out of this passage of Scripture. Take a look at verse 12. Paul actually introduces a new word to us here that's not found in the New Testament up until this point. He says, For the administration of this service, 
Now, the word service has been used a bunch of times already in the New Testament, but this is a Greek word that's brand new, and it really means a priestly service, a service like what a priest would have done. It is a spiritual service, a spiritual sacrifice. He, he does mention here, only time it's mentioned, the administration of this service, it not only supplies the needs of the saints, that's the one time where he mentions the physical needs of the people in Jerusalem, but notice what else he says, but also is abounding through God many thanksgiving, uh, through many thanksgivings to God. In other words, in other words, if the Corinthians give and give generously, people are going to glorify God and they're going to thank God for what He's doing. How and why? Well, verse 13 answers that. Through the proof of this ministry, they will glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ. The first thing they're going to say in Jerusalem, where the Jewish believers are living, is they're going to say, you know what? I can't believe what these Gentile believers have done. I can't believe how generous they've been to us. They must really honestly know the same Jesus we know. They must really honestly be filled with the same Holy Spirit with which we are filled. And they're living out the gospel. They're going to praise God for that. Not just for the gift, but for the evidence of the salvation of the givers. Not only that, he goes on to say, and they will praise for your liberal sharing with them. They're going, to, they're going to give God the glory for all that you have given to them, but not just to them. They're going to praise God for how you have shared with all people. They will praise God for the fact that other people are receiving help from your gift. They're not going to be focused on why didn't we get more. They're going to be praising God that other people were helped. Verse 14 goes on to say, And by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Now, there's two things that are mentioned there. He says, Because of your generosity, the Macedonians are, are already praying for you. And because of your generosity, when it gets to Jerusalem, the Jerusalem believers are going to be praying for you. But wait a minute. They don't even know them. They'll probably never see them this side of heaven. Why in the world would somebody a thousand miles away be praying for the folks back in Corinth? Because they've demonstrated their connectedness in Christ through their generosity. They're going to be praying. And they're going to be longing for you. Longing for them? Longing to, to know and to see and to thank people in person that they will never see or be able to thank in person this side of heaven? Yes. Now you put that together. You've got people that are praying for you, people who love you, and they've never even met you. But the reason that that's happening is because the church is being drawn together. Now, now, put all this together with me, would you? God's being glorified. God's being thanked for all that God has done. There's an unselfish focus now in the church because we're thanking God for what God's doing for everybody, and it's bringing the family of Christ closer together. Now, all of those things can only happen when the church has the right perspective. And that's the third thing that generosity can do. Generosity will help give the church the right perspective. You know, the church of Jesus Christ can get focused on a lot of things that we ought not be focused on. Amen belongs right there. We need something that's going to help orient us in the direction God helps us to be in. Let, let, me, let me illustrate this way. This is a tabletop telescope. Hi, I'm Joel, and I'm a nerd. And I love nerdy things. Now, this telescope can zoom in really tight on some things. Like, wow. Okay, I'm, I'm not even going to tell you what I just saw, but never mind. It can zoom in really tight and give you extreme clarity on things that are far, far away, Right? But if you're trying to find a particular thing in the nighttime sky and you're using the main scope on this, it is really difficult to find it because its, it's optic is very small. It's looking at something with a very narrow view. So they give you this handy-dandy little finder scope over here on the side. And guys, if you were to look through this, you would see in the finder scope, this little cute little guy here, uh, you would find crosshairs like on a rifle scope in there. And the idea is that you look through the finder scope and you, you get the crosshairs on exactly what you want to look at. Then 
you zoom in with the big scope. Okay, does that make sense? Telescope Operations 101. What in the world does it have to do with the preacher's sermon? Well, here's what it has to do. Let's set this back here. Generosity gets our priorities and our focus pointed to the right thing, just like that cute little finder scope. You might not be able to see a whole lot through it, but it gets your big scope pointed in the right direction. Our generosity clarifies our priorities perhaps more than any other thing. It puts us in a place to where we are focused on God, to where we're thanking God for what He has given us, and thanking God so much for what He is giving us that we freely and joyfully and cheerfully give it away. And we see other people within the, the family of God being helped, and that draws the family of God closer together. When we are zoomed in on God's priorities, when we get pointed in His direction, we're going to see His will and we're going to see His work with much greater clarity. But if we get focused on other things, without being pointed in His direction, we will be intently focused, but we will be intently focused on a great many things that are not His things. Our generosity is one of the most tangible places where we express our priorities. Your, your financial records and your schedule will clarify for you what your priorities really are, perhaps more than any other thing. If we spend our time and we spend our money on ourselves, then that is a very clear indication that our focus is on ourselves. But if we spend our time and our money and only spend enough time and money on ourselves, which is necessary to sustain ourselves so that we can go on serving God and then give God the rest, we will, and here's the key, if we do that, we will never have a deficit of joy. You will never have a deficit of joy. You cannot go to Walgreens or CVS or any other pharmacy and buy a bottle full of joy. You cannot find it. But if you are willing to operate your finances and your schedule in such a way as to do it in a way that will bring God glory, you will never have to look for joy. You'll always have it. Let me put a bow on this entire sermon series. And for the next few minutes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about giving, but please understand that for the next several minutes, we're going to talk about giving in terms of not only giving money, but giving time, giving our talents, giving every resource that God has put into our management. I'm convinced that there are three kinds of givers. Three kinds of givers. Giving givers of time, givers of money, givers of other... But, but three kinds of givers. There are sad givers, there are mad givers, and there are glad givers. Sad givers, mad givers, and glad givers. If you view giving, whether it's of your time or of your money, if you view giving as giving away something with no hope of getting anything, you will view your giving as a debit. It will always be something that costs you. And you will be either giving as a sad giver. Oh, I hate to do this. This doesn't bring me any joy. That's a sad giver. Or you will be a mad giver. I wouldn't be doing this, but they made me. I got pressured into this. Wasn't my idea. Sad givers, mad givers. If that describes anybody you know, then I can assure you that their giving will be shallow and it will be short-lived. They won't give much of their time, of their talent, of their intellect, of their love, of their relationships, or their money. And what they do give won't last long because they will find an excuse not to give it anymore.
because they are giving out of sadness or getting out of madness. But if you view giving of your time, of your money, of all your resources, if you view giving as an investment in God's work, out of love for God, with a certain hope that He will reward that investment with blessings that money cannot buy, then you will see your giving of your time, your talent, your money as an investment, not a debit, but an investment. Your giving will be glad giving because you will know that there will come a return on that investment and that the return on that investment will always be of greater value than the gift ever was. Your giving will be sacrificial. It will not be shallow. And your giving will be a way of life. It will not be short-lived. Because you have an expectancy that God will always meet it with joy. So as we close all this, yes, give. Give sacrificially. Some of you are already doing that. But give sacrificially so that material things will not become or remain an idol in your life. Give sacrificially so that the gift never becomes more important to you than the giver. And seek to meet the, the needs of others. Seek to meet the needs of others by first valuing them and then investing in them. Always being mindful that meeting physical needs is only an inroad to meeting someone's spiritual needs. Here's what I mean. If all we do is feed the hungry and never give them, never introduce them to the bread from heaven who is Jesus Christ, we have done them a terrible disservice. And lastly, glorify God. Glorify God in it. Give thanks. Give thanks for what He's given you and to what He's given to others. God loves, He honors, and He blesses a glad giver. And while the other two, the sad giver and the mad giver, may give, God will bless that gift. But that sad giver and that mad giver cheat themselves out of the blessing that God wants to give them in return. Don't cheat yourself. Be a glad giver.